Hello and thank you for downloading the History Hour podcast from the BBC World Service. This is Max Pearson with more memories of key moments from the past. This week, gorillas in the mist. But we hear the darker side of trying to save the great apes in Rwanda. Elsewhere, we're in a World War II Japanese internment camp. Also, the murder of a Brazilian environmentalist and the British MP who faked his own death leaving a pile of clothes on the beach. But first, in millions of households on the morning of Christmas Day, it's a safe bet that in amongst the gift wrapping, there will have been the plastic cover of the computer game Grand Theft Auto V. The latest incarnation of the game, which pits the player against the combined forces of the law in a mythical cityscape, loosely based on various American metropoli, has been phenomenally successful. Sales of the franchise run into billions of dollars. Who should we thank, or who's to blame, depending on your standpoint? Well, we're taking you back now to the launch of the very first version of the game, developed in Scotland during the mid-1990s. Paul Schuster has been speaking to one of the people behind Grand Theft Auto. It's the lead-up to Christmas 1997, and Britain is in the midst of a moral debate and a media storm. Still to come tonight, do video games like this lead to joyriding and dangerous driving? Violent computer and video games involving cars may have to include a special warning about reckless driving. The news comes on the same day as the launch of a controversial new game featuring car hijacks and joyriding. It's hardly in the festive spirit called Grand Theft Auto. It's been widely criticised for its violence. If you go and look at the game now and you look at the graphics and you look at the actual content, it's about as offensive as Pac-Man. But we got some real controversy and it really kicked off a storm. Brian Baglow was a writer on the original Grand Theft Auto and was also part of the publicity campaign surrounding the launch. Questions were asked in the House of Commons. Questions were asked in the House of Lords. We had journalists camping outside the office and (laughs) reporters showing up at my tiny little end terrace house in Kinross to come and bang on the door and demand what the hell did I think I was doing to civilization? Can we be sure this sort of video game in which you score points for murder and drug running isn't available to children? But for this small company launching its new computer game, everything was actually going perfectly to plan. The marketing team decided, well, you know what, let's play up this kind of bad boy thing a little bit. Max Clifford is a notorious publicist and PR person in the UK. He was the man that masterminded the media blitz. What happened was he got on the phone to, I think it was the News of the World, got on the phone to them and said, new game coming out, computer game, uh, steal cars, shoot policemen, run people over, and you could just hear the outrage on the other end of the phone. What? Oh, good God, right, okay, we'll do something with this. They wanted to talk to the heads of the company, and Dave Jones, who founded the company and ran DMA, is a thoroughly nice chap, and surprisingly wasn't too keen to be smeared throughout the British press as this bad boy and this criminal and this horrible person who was going to corrupt the minds of youth and bring about the fall of civilization. So it ended up being me, (laughs) the PR guy. So to this day, my parents still have a copy of the News of the World where I'm scowling at the camera. The headline's something like, Sick Car Crime Boss in Tot Smash Shock. And what happened was they turned an incident where I skidded on black ice in my little one-litre mini metro a few years earlier and crashed into a tree. And that turned into a high-speed pursuit with the police and had, you know, little phrases and quotes like, it's lucky there were no drugs in the car. Quipped Baglow. You enjoy playing your part. (laughs) I really enjoyed it. It was getting the phone call from my dad and he was like, but it's not true. And I'm like, I know it's not true. It's okay. This is just what I do now. For Brian Baglow and the team at DMA Design, this launch was the culmination of several years of hard work. I'm at DMA Design, a Dundee success story. This computer game company had a smash hit with Lemmings and now hopes Grand Theft Auto will be its next big winner. But over the years the game was in development, there were no guarantees it would even reach the shelves. Originally, the idea was to do something like a superhero game. You know, so you go and clean up the city. And this was all the way back in 1993, 94. The technology was quite limited. And so eventually, Dave Jones, the guy who founded DMA Design and is widely considered the godfather of gaming when it comes to Scotland, said, hey, let's drop some cars in. And pretty soon you could actually drive a car through the city. And from there it became, wow, you could play a policeman and you could be going and cleaning up the city. For an awful lot of the first couple of years, it was just trying to make the cities work. It was trying to get this infrastructure working. 
before anybody even thought about how to make the game fun. And then once we got all of these elements in place, it became very, very clear quite quickly that it wasn't. It wasn't fun at all. And in fact, it was quite dull. And the reason for this was that you were playing a cop. It's not an awful lot of fun playing as the good guy. Eventually, the consensus that came out of the design meeting was, well, why don't we let you play the bad guy? And that's when it all kind of started to look and feel right, presumably. Once we had decided that you were the bad guy, the game made sense. All of this infrastructure, all of this traffic, all of these emergency services are basically responding to you. And it's what we now call sandbox gaming, an open world game. So you can just go where you wish, do as you please, but the world reacts to you. But at the time, this was brand new. Now, this is DMA's music department. As you can see, they do use real instruments here. Let's find out what they've been doing for the Grand Theft Auto project. I'm working on a radio station at the moment, the hip-hop station. There's a variety of different stations in each car that you go into. Every time you get into a car, you get different music. Yeah. The guys in the audio team were simply the best in the world. And they thought, well, you're going to be jumping in and out of cars. Why doesn't every car have a different type of music? And from there it was a short hop to, OK, there are going to be different radio stations. And Colin, who was the head of the audio department, came, spoke to me and said, OK, heavy metal, country and western, can you do lyrics? Well, it was back in 1849 at the Springfield Golden Nugget Mine. I had the job of coming up with lyrics for a country and western track, which became the ballad of Chapped Lips Calhoun, and the heavy metal track, which is Four Letter Love. There are not a lot of jobs where you can go home and talk to your wife and she said, so what did you do today? And you go, I wrote a country and western song about the men of Springfield in, in the United States dynamiting the mine to seal their wives in because they found them a bit scary. And then the following week you say, well, I wrote some lyrics for a heavy metal track. OK, and how did that go? And you say, well, I managed to fit in every curse word and blasphemy that I know. And that was fun. <laughs> but despite the end product being given an 18 certificate, there was still confusion in the marketplace about exactly who this game was for. I think it's mainly young people who would be interested in playing such a game. And young people nowadays are those who have and use the machines which uh, play the games. The media hysteria, the outrage, was all about the fact that, hold on, games are for children. Good God, they're trying to corrupt our children. And that was, that was the real issue. It wasn't about the game itself. I think it highlighted a big misconception in British culture and British society, which is that games are for children. I guess it's also one of those situations where people think to themselves, what if playing violent video games causes someone to go out and do something violent? Well, the whole notion that violent games cause violent behaviour is something that persists to this day. And it's simply not true. My son and I used to sit and play Grand Theft Auto before he was 18, but that was my choice as a parent. And I would check in with him and say, now you do realise, and he would look at me with withering scorn and go, I know, Dad, it's a game. And to this date, he's never stolen a car or indeed carjacked anybody. So, you know, I think there's an awful lot of nonsense spoken about violent games causing crime. And it tends to be by people who have never ever picked up a joypad or a joystick in their lives. The Grand Theft Auto series has made more money than Hollywood blockbusters Avatar and Titanic combined, raking in billions of dollars. The game is still produced in Scotland by new owners Rockstar Games. And for those who were there at the very beginning, it's all been quite a lot to take in. I can't believe where the game has ended up of what it's gone on to achieve because we were just proud that we actually got the damn thing finished and got it to work and that it was good fun. And what it's gone on to actually become is absolutely jaw-dropping. Brian Baglow still lives in Scotland and still works in computer games. Paul Schuster, who claims he's not an addict of that particular genre of computer game, but there are millions of people of a certain age who are... Guy Cocker is a games journalist. He follows the twists and turns of the industry and has done so for many years now. He's been telling me about the first time he played Grand Theft Auto. 
It was a game where you would play as as the kind of robber against the cops. And even at the time, it was released uh, mid nineteen nineties. Even at the time, it, the thing that was interesting about it was that it was very retro. It was seen from a top down perspective. Uh, very simple graphics, very basic graphics, but a very um, simple gameplay loop, which is you would go and steal a car, try and get away from the cops, and perform various types of missions. I think what set it aside for me as a, as a sort of hardcore gamer was the fact that it it had amazing humour. It was one of the first games to have distinct radio stations that you could tune into with its own DJs and its own soundtracks. But it was really, it was very satirical. It was very, very well written. It's very rare for a game to be that funny. It's uh, something that video games as a medium still struggle to do, to be that funny. When you say it's, it's funny and satirical, is that, does the game itself have a narrative One of the key facets of the Grand Theft Auto series is that it's an open world game. So whereas a lot of games require you to go and follow the path that the game designers want you to follow very rigidly so that they can tell you a story, Grand Theft Auto is an open world game where you kind of make your own fun. And the games have become more sophisticated over time. The the game that's just been released, Grand Theft Auto V, this year, there are comments there on racial stereotypes in America, the media coverage of events, things like companies like Facebook. There's one mission where you have to infiltrate a company that's very similar to Facebook. And it's it's a very much a commentary on, on modern life and modern society. It's very skewed and it's very heightened, but it, that's, the, that's the genius of the Grand Theft Auto series is that it does speak to a generation of, of young men such as myself. I'm, I'm 31, but it took to a generation of people. I would say Grand Theft Auto is as important as movies like Scarface and The Godfather. It is at that level now where it's, it really does mean a lot to a generation of young men, I would say. The reason we're talking about Grand Theft Auto is because it has become such a huge... Uh, industry from this very small beginnings uh, in Scotland and it's become if you like something of a of a cultural moment for the uh, 20th into the 21st century I, I would say that Grand Theft Auto uh, it will it may sound to people that don't play video games it may sound uh, ridiculous but is one of the cultural high points of the year it's um it's a game that when it was released in September uh, sold 1.6 million copies in a, in a day in, in the UK and we're talking uh, about billions of dollars billions now. of dollars I mean it's it's looking likely that it'll pass 1.5 billion dollars in sales um, this year. And the future of gaming? And where, where are we all going to be sitting in sort of virtual reality <laughs> pods, where the world, as it exists outside, is irrelevant, and what is going to be going on is all going to be created by by computers around us. Games are getting more and more immersive. I think the the next five years is is going to look quite similar to how it how it does now in terms of uh, consoles, traditional consoles like the PlayStation Four and Xbox One, which just launched last month, um, sitting as a box under the TV. But games are just going to become more and more just prevalent across all devices but yes if you want to look beyond that there are that i've uh, been lucky enough to play some incredible incredibly immersive virtual reality headsets and this has been the dream for uh, video game makers and i think the general public for quite a long time now wearing a headset and being truly immersed in a world and there's a product called oculus rift which is coming out next year which is a- an actually a very good uh, headset which is affordable they're looking at between 200 and 300 pounds to buy it will predominantly be for the pc at first but i think the technology will come through the only thing they need to sort out right now which they they've they've said that they've kind of come to a point where it's where it's getting better is you can still feel slightly nauseous when you're playing it which is not that much fun you know when you're looking around it's you can't see your legs and there's this weird thing that goes on in your brain where your your body feels disconnected and it, it's very difficult to describe but other than that incredibly immersive and so the video games industry is finally getting to that dream of creating um, virtual reality i think guy cocker computer games journalist with a taste of what the future might hold Imagine that. So long as you can afford one of the 3D headsets, you could live in a whole other world. But would that be discharging your responsibilities to the real world, to the planet on which we live? While you contemplate that, let's take you from the comfort of your living room to the lush heights of Rwanda's Volcanoes National Park. 